<laughs> My siblings, I grew up um, number six of seven kids, two are deceased. My youngest sister lives in Omaha, Nebraska. And, you know, many of us have siblings. They know us. They know our reality. And they say, Joe? <laughs> What's he doing? <laughs> What's going on? Joe? That quiet kid we grew up with? But when we come to know our Eucharistic Lord through his blessed mother, you know, it gives it, it has given me a strength that wasn't mine. And it really happened since I became a bishop. I was a priest of about 27 years there in the Diocese of Tyler that it became after I was there. I was on the ground floor of the very beginning of the Diocese of Tyler. February 24th, 1987, the first bishop was ordained, Bishop Charles Fursey. I was there as one of the four masters of ceremonies. Um, he was ordained in what, you know, Texas oil, East Texas, the East Texas oil fields. Bishop Herzig, our first bishop, was ordained in the oil palace built by um, a Lebanese family that were wealthy in oil. And uh, I'll, you know, chest some of your ages. Uh, Jack Dempsey oh. <laughs> taught that he had that was a big deal, you know. But that's what the oil palace was built for. Bishop Herzig uh, named it the Holy Oil Palace <laughs> because he was ordained there in 1987. So and that's what's it, it's so interesting. My hmm. life and what's going on now. To be removed from the diocese where I grew up and where I've been a priest for the whole history of the diocese. I was one of the 35 originals. Um, I don't know how I got on that tangent, but it's all about our Lord in the Eucharist. And thankfully, as a kid, I was, I'm 65, born in 1958. Grew up there, born in, in San Antonio, or Fredericksburg, which is near San Antonio. Moved to Atlanta, Texas when I was four years old. So all I remember really is Atlanta, Texas. Very Protestant. Um, when our family moved to Atlanta in 1963, June of 1963, we moved there. And I've told people many times in many different talks, even as a seminarian, and it's almost the literal truth that when the, the six Strickland kids with our parents moved to Atlanta, Texas, we doubled the Catholic population. <laughs> <laughs> that really is maybe a little exaggeration, but not much. There were a couple of other Catholic families, and they started a a little mission of the Glen Mary priest. Some of you may know Glen Mary. Sadly, it's not really flourishing as a religious community, but they targeted going to the rural south to bring what they called no priest land. And that's where we were. My mother, a cradle Catholic, very committed, well catechized. She's the one that really taught us. My father converted. He was born there in East Texas. My mother from Sydney, Australia, Irish Catholic background. As I mentioned at the table, my great-grandmother was born on a ship going from Ireland <coughs> to Australia. Imagine wow. that journey. Wow. <clears throat> my grandmother, um, Veronica McGovern, very Irish, all transported to Australia. But one of the, the you know, when I entered the seminary at 18, I knew I wanted to try it out. I wanted to, as I told my older sister, get the monkey off my back. <laughs> and 
it was just the right place for me. I felt that, and my Irish-Australian grandmother, Veronica McGovern, so Catholic, so proud to have a grandson becoming a priest. I mean, kind of ripped my heart out when she said, because it was heartache to have one of her beloved daughters go to Texas. I mean, it's like, go to the moon, go to Mars. I mean, and in those years, I mean, my mother left Australia in 1946. They'd been married about six months when my mother came to uh, Louisiana and then Texas. <clears throat> but in those years, I remember as a kid growing up, you know, a big gift, and it was expensive. Like a, a major Christmas gift was a phone call for my mother to call her parents on Christmas. It was like $50 for five minutes or something, which was, you know, in today's terms, it's like $200. And it was, you know, calling the operator. And now it amazes me. I love to pick up a cell phone and say, I'm making a phone ring in Australia. Just punching some buttons on a cell phone. Um, anyway, um, so I grew up with that. I grew up with the, the understanding. I, in, you know, we all have different, you know, sort of incidentals of our lives that we come to see were quite significant, really. But growing up in the little town of Atlanta, Texas, as we were saying, I was an Atlanta rabbit, not a jackrabbit, just a bunny rabbit. That was the football team. But we won the Texas State Championship. All right. I mean, imagine rabbits beating the tigers of the lions and the bears. All these, the rabbits go on. <clears throat> but growing up there, being Catholic and having a mother from Australia, and, you know, and most little boys, but it was true for my mother, she was movie, movie star beautiful. And so for me, being Catholic, and having an Australian movie star beautiful mother, that, those were my tickets to, to life. I mean, that was great. And we were taught the Catholic faith is the greatest thing you have. We didn't have money. We grew up on 100 acres with cows and horses and dogs and cats and bull nettles, if you ever heard of a bull nettle. Um, it's an East Texas thing, I guess, but what is it? I don't know. What's the it's a it's a nettle oh, out in the cow pasture that you don't want to rub against no. because it hurts. Yeah. And I've done it a few times. But anyway, growing up there, being Catholic opened up the world. Because my mother constantly reminded us that, you know, yeah. You think here, oh, it's you're either Baptist or Methodist, maybe Church of Christ, but nobody's Catholic. <laughs> My mother assured us, Catholic is big. And so I went to the University of Dallas in, in Irving, Texas, in the suburb of Dallas, the small Catholic university that's still there and still very faithfully Catholic, learned a classical education. <laughs> we didn't talk about it, but I remember... You know, I'm just a kid from Atlanta, Texas. And I had some excellent teachers. As you look back, I'm sure a lot of us can say, I was a great teacher in a small school, but rural and everything. But I had some great teachers in high school. But <clears throat> I remember thinking, you know, it's like, University of Dallas, it's like math class and history class and English class. It's all taking, talking about the same people. You know, what's going on? <laughs> but that's classic education. <laughs> It all comes together. And Catholic, I mean, I'm, I'm so glad to see the Catholic, or the classic education, because as I said, I'm sorry, I didn't even get your name. Jack Rimes. Jack? Yes. As we were talking about it, we need to just drop the classic and say education. That's what it is. It's learning these, this web of wonder of humanity 
woven together through history. <clears throat> and the Catholic Church is part of that marvelous web of history. You can't, I mean, in East Texas, they try to extract it and say, oh, we don't want to talk about the Catholics. How do you talk about real history and not talk about the Catholics for 2,000 years? So, being Catholic and Eucharist, um, as you're probably all familiar with John Bosco, I mean, it's become very significant. I mean, I think we're living St. John Bosco's vision. The church in a storm with the pillar of the Eucharist in Mary. I mean, that's, that's my life. And I, I'm sort of in the middle of the storm, but the Eucharist, our Lord in the Eucharist, and Mary, you know, you just <laughs> hang on, hang on. And they're, they're there. Permanent, strong, unchanging truth that we cling to. You know, growing up in the 60s and then the 70s, going to seminary in 1977, I entered Holy Trinity Seminary. You know, those are crazy years. But thankfully, the basics I always had. I mean, maybe some of you, I know, I hear a lot of stories of people that are what we call reverts, that, you know, wandered off and then came back, came to their senses and came back to their Catholic faith. You know, at 18, I entered the seminary, so I never wandered off. But it's gone deeper and deeper. And, and I, I mean, I was just in prayer recently, thinking about, because I've prayed, I mean, I've done a lot of confirmations. I've been anointed with the oil of prison at mm -hmm. baptism, at confirmation, at priesthood, and for the episcopacy. So, I should... Mm -hmm. be strong in the spirit that should be the way things are but that I know is what has strengthened me the, the Holy Spirit working through baptism, confirmation and the two levels of holy orders and deepening my Eucharistic faith um, as I look back and I'm sure a lot of us can do the same and say man that was really connected, and you didn't, you know, you're just a kid. I mean, I grew up, like I said, five <laughs> miles out of town, so getting a ride to town was sort of a major deal. So once you got one, you kind of hung around in town, and I used to hang around and say, well, I'd go to the church and pray. Nobody told me to. Well, I guess the Holy Spirit was telling me to. <laughs> But, you know, my parents didn't even know. I mean, back in those years, we were just, you know, doing our thing. I mean, our parents had taught us well, but they, I mean, we didn't have cell phones. The phone was still a, on, with a cord attached to the wall. I mean, many of us remember those phones, except some of these people. But, uh, <laughs> Do I like he's pointing at you? I think he was pointing at you. <laughs> the youngster here. Um, But, uh, but you went to the church to pray. Wow. And the Lord started pulling me. I, I realize it now to a deeper Eucharistic faith. I've always believed in the real presence. And I've always said, I mean, I used to teach altar service. The most important thing is to be reverent. You may forget, you may get nervous, you may fall asleep, whatever. <laughs> Be reverent because of who's there. And that has just deepened over and over again for me. Um, that's why, you know, the, the travesty of saying, man, it doesn't matter. Anybody can, I mean, you know, frankly, the guy down the street in the White House receiving the, that is a travesty for him. Yeah. Besides everyone else, and it's a travesty for everyone, but for him, he's, a Joe, I'm Joe, he's Joe. And to not tell Joe, don't do this unless you reform your life. A travesty, a, a deep brokenness and sin of the world and of the church that has to be fixed, has to be addressed out of love. 
out of the deepest compassion that we can imagine because it flows from Jesus Christ. But a deepening faith in the Eucharist, a deepening faith in the Immaculate Virgin Mary. And frankly, I think as I started speaking up as a bishop, and it really, um, it's interesting, Kevin Wells, some of you may, he's, he's here, Baltimore guy, mm -hmm. but he wrote uh, an article for mm -hmm. Crisis Magazine that I encourage you all to go to, because he talks about me, which well, isn't the re reason to go to it, but he talks about how the five years ago, to, to the day, yesterday, I stood up as this country bishop from Tyler, Texas. Most of those bishops don't know where that is. They don't care. Really. But I stood up and said, do we believe this or not? And I didn't use the name, but everybody knew who I was talking about. I said, there's a priest, Father James Martin, that's traveling the, the nation, and I guess the world now, with the stamp of approval of Pope Francis, traveling and, and contradicting the faith it, to the detriment of people. Uh, one of the, the recent stories for me, there in Tyler, a lady came, you know, that I met before. She actually lives in Shreveport, Louisiana, which is right over the border between Texas and Louisiana. And she came up and said, My, I think her brother, someone connected to her, said, Please thank Bishop Strickland because what, what I've said helped him to pull away from a gay lifestyle and recognize the truth. And I said, thank you for telling me that. And I've been contacted by people. And it's not, you know, I mean, it's portrayed as so, I mean, I'm accused of being unloving. and be, It's the greatest love to call away from a destructive, destructive force that, you know, it takes many different forms, but I think we have to understand that and know that, and that's what gives me strength. I mean, you know, like I said, with the three men that are here from North Texas that are here with me, we've spent time in adoration, and I need it. I need that time. I couldn't keep going without going back to recharge my batteries with the Lord. And, and I have to tell you, brothers and sisters, you know, probably many of you have heard about, maybe some of you have experienced this great mystical experience of Mary appearing or hearing voices. None of that's happened for me. <laughs> but in here, it has happened. A transforming, and it, and I guess the way I think about it, it's like a little bit of a delayed reaction. Spending time with the Lord in His Eucharistic face, there with Him. Later on, the fruits of that are there in in speaking, in being bold enough. Five years ago, and you know, my mouth was a little dry. I was a little nervous. You can go back and watch the video. And it was like, man, is that Mr. Pollyanna? I mean, it was very mild, but also bold enough to say, do we believe this or not? And how can we allow false messengers be welcomed into our diocese, creating havoc for the children of God? And here we are, fast forward five years later, and Kevin Wells is coming out with another article. I won't do a spoiler alert, but just look for the next article. Kevin said he's going to write it tomorrow, but watch for his next article commenting on all of that and the juxtaposition of me and another priest in that room 
in the different paths mm -hmm. we're on. Mm -hmm. it, it really is. I mean, Kevin's a great writer. And it's a great <coughs> illustration of where the brokenness is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, really, I talk about Eucharist a lot because it's the Lord. He's there. Body and blood, soul and divinity. We all believe that or we wouldn't be having this great meal together. But beyond the Eucharist and more the, I mean, that's the, the supernatural. I mean, you know, and as I've said to my brothers that are here with me, we're in a crisis of supernatural faith. Because to stand at the altar or the, the counter in the hotel room that we've been using this one. But it doesn't really matter. Treated with reverence and understanding what's happening there. Absolutely, it should be a beautiful marble altar. I think the counter is it's a nice hotel. I think it's <laughs> granite or something. You know. So at least it's not formica. But it's okay. what happens there is what's important. And the reverence and the faith to believe that simple bread and wine become the king of the universe right there in a hotel room. And so Eucharistic faith nurtures us, and it's nurtured me, to do what this young man, Jack, Jack. <laughs> has been doing since, what, 1984? The year before I was ordained a priest? 1987. 87? Okay. Well, I had a couple of years there. Okay. The year the diocese was created, 1987. Promoting what we absolutely are obligated, all of us, to speak for, to stand for, to fight for those who can't speak, can't stand, can't fight the unborn. And as I've tried to say to other bishops and to priests, and you know, as I talk a lot, uh, continue. <laughs> if we don't protect and respect the unborn, then the the gates of hell are opened. We're next. They're not going to prevail against the church, but they're open. And you know, the child trafficking. The, the abuse of children that sadly come from even priests and bishops. The, I mean, I don't have to go through the whole litany. We know it. But I've tried to help people understand. When you don't respect the most innocent, the most fragile, the voiceless, unborn life. And sadly, I mean, Michael, we, give this man a hand. <laughs> Michael, <laughs> He has valiantly continued to fight, and I've done a little bit here and there with him, but it gets ignored. We don't take up the Campaign for Human Development or the um, Catholic, Relief Catholic Relief Services collections because they're corrupted, and that is so tragic because they do help hungry people and poor people, but... If you're helping a few hungry people and poor people and promoting a little abortion here and there and promoting contraception, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And that's what Michael's trying to expose. And I can personally say I've written and gotten probably just a form letter that you probably got a whole file of <laughs> saying, oh, yeah, we understand your concern, but we've got it all explained. Don't worry. It's fine. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's corrupt. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what Kevin Wells, I mean, not on that specific issue, but the corruption that's there. Yeah. And again, so not, not condemning any I person, think so. but I mean, I think it's a recognizing we've got to, to confess the corruption. So the and I use They're that right word here. confess yeah, very specifically because okay, basically, and what this Senate is promoting. And it's, it's ongoing, I hate to say. I wish it was done, but it's got a whole other year. But what it's promoting is confess. That needs to go out of our Catholic vocabulary. Nothing to confess, just come together. 
dialogue. Just be, you know, oh, whatever. But <laughs> confess your sins. Don't bother. And that, to me, is the root of Cardinal Pell that we were talking about um, at the table. What's the word? Toxic nightmare. Toxic, Toxic nightmare. Toxic nightmare. <laughs> That man died January 10th of this year, shortly after Pope Benedict. I mean, that, you know, I know we were all saying, Whoa, what's going on here? It sort of introduced the year 2023. And where are we? With wars and rumors of wars, rumors of more terrible wars than we would even want to imagine, and divisions and, and all the stuff going on. So, Probably already talked too long, but not at all. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> now, the main thing change. that I would say climate we'll change. <laughs> no, I'm not going to talk about climate change. Okay. <laughs> well, of course, it is getting a little is. warm in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the main thing I would want to say to close is all of this never. Never, never let it take your hope and your joy. Right. Because we know Jesus Christ. He's conquered it all. He tells us in the gospel, they hated me. What are you worried about if they hate you? And, you know, we're in a time, I mean, I've, I've joked with friends that, you know, a few centuries ago, you might be you might be here with a headless bishop. <laughs> We're too polite for that now. We're too woke. We're too advanced. But in some ways, it's even more sinister. Oh, we'll let you keep your head. We'll just rip your heart out. We'll just rip out your soul. And it's like, what do you need a head for? You don't have a soul. But that's, you know, that's kind of where we are. And, you know, I, part of the litany of complaints against me that was delivered to me is not respectful to the Holy Father. And that really is a dagger to the heart of a priest and a bishop who loves Christ, loves his church, loves the Petron office. And as I said to the bishops that came in, I call it the Inquisition, but it was uh, the apostolic visitation back in June. I said to them, you know, because they said, oh, we're concerned that you're not respectful to Pope Francis. And I said, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest respect I can show the Holy Father is to guard the deposit of faith. Yes. Absolutely. They disagree. I'll join the choir. I'm, uh, I'm absolutely <laughs> preaching to the choir. But uh, thank you for your faith. Let us never lose hope. The great, I, I'm, a, I'm a Catholic, so I can't quote chapter and verse, but. <laughs> <laughs> but St. Paul tells us be able to share with whoever you encounter the reason for your hope. Let us continue that. Hope and joy and really be on the line. And I go back to conclude with, you know, my parents, Monica and Raymond Strickland, a kid, a boy from East Texas who became Catholic, very faithful Catholic, but always, you know, it was like when we had a catechism question, it was like, ask your mother. Yeah. Because, you know, he was a convert and didn't, he wasn't a studier of the faith, but he was very faithful. Always at Mass, made sure that we did everything that my mother said, they got to do this. <laughs> um, and probably many of us grew up that way. But thank you for your faith. Thank you, Jack, for your commitment. Thank you for all of you who are committed to really educating, really guarding the sanctity of life, living the truth. And it doesn't change. We go deeper into the great mystery. God is truth. Christ is truth incarnate. But all this garbage, frankly, 
about, oh, it needs to change. No. It's not going to. All the documents can be written with some sort of woke slant. I hope not. But some have been, some will. It doesn't change the truth. No. The truth is there. The truth, and I, I, I keep saying in closing, but I, I, I promise this. Jesus Christ is the person. He is truth incarnate. And as I've come to know him more deeply, and I still have a long way to go, if we're smart, we all know that. We can't ever exhaust the mystery of who Jesus Christ is. But he is truth incarnate. And knowing him, he doesn't change. You just go deeper into his sacred heart. God bless you.